Okay, we're going to solve this differential equation. So the first thing to think about anytime you solve any differential equation is what kind is it? Because that tells you something about what the nature of the solution is going to be like. So the first thing I would notice is that this is third order and it is linear. So thinking about what is applied to that dependent variable, only differentiation and multiplying by a function of the independent variable within each term. Uh, so this is third order linear. And because the right-hand side of the differential equation, when it's written in this form with all the derivatives on one side and all the dependent variables on one side, the right-hand side of the differential equation is just the constant function zero, this homogeneous differential equation. So third order linear homogeneous differential equation. So just thinking back to what we know about higher order linear homogeneous differential equations, we know that this has something to do with vector spaces. The solution space to this differential equation is dimension three. It's the same as the order of the differential equation. So that means that I need three linearly independent solutions. I'll just call them y1, y2, and y3 to form a basis for the solution space. And so then taking the span of that set gives me the entire solution space, or in other words, the set of all solutions to this differential equation. So this is what I'm after, three linearly independent solutions that would form a basis for this solution space. So we have a lot of different ways of solving higher order differential equations, and so sorting through all of that. Um, if this were a constant coefficient differential equation, so if these coefficient functions were all constants, could use a characteristic polynomial, that's probably the easiest way that we did uh, solving these differential equations. Uh, we also learned some other methods for non-homogeneous differential equations if this right-hand side were not just the zero function. We could use those, not applicable in this case. Um, we also talked about Laplace transforms, and while Laplace transforms perhaps would work on this differential equation, I don't have initial conditions, so that makes it pretty difficult to use Laplace transforms. Um, so sorting through the different methods we did, uh, the next thing I would think about is well, if I have variable coefficient functions and it's not obvious how to do it some other way, that I might try a series solution. So this might be one that you would try a series solution for. You would figure out pretty quickly though that those series don't turn out to be infinite series. They actually turn out to be finitely many terms because this is a Cauchy-Euler equation. So our textbook really just does second order Cauchy-Euler equations. But we mentioned that that can be extended to higher order differential equations as well. So the idea here is that your coefficient functions are power functions, and the power on that x matches the order on this derivative. The power on the independent variable matches the order of the derivative of the dependent variable within each term, so this is 4x to the first. We could also have a y term, and that wouldn't have any x, so I might think about x to the zero for that coefficient function. So you could try uh, finding a series solution for this. It would be a Frobenius series that you might try. You would figure out that those series, though, terminate and are only finitely many terms. And so we actually started with that, Cauchy-Euler equations, rather than doing the series and then looking at the special case when they all terminate. We started by looking at these kind and recognizing it as a Cauchy-Euler equation. If you do that, then you don't have to mess with the series, and you just start with a guess that your solutions, your three linearly independent solutions, are going to be of the form y equals x to the r. And then you take the appropriate derivatives and substitute in. With a series solution, you would do a similar sort of thing, but you'd be guessing an infinite series of powers. Um, but take appropriate derivatives, substitute in, and figure out the r values that work. And then depending on the R values, hopefully you get the right number of linearly independent solutions. All right, so let's go ahead and find these derivatives. So this is just very simple derivatives, like you remember from Calc 1, bringing down the exponent and subtracting 1 each time. So I am just need three derivatives here, since it's a third order differential equation. All right, so We've used many methods that involve making a guess for a form of a solution and then substitute into the differential equation. This should feel very familiar to you. 
Uh, all right, so I'm going to substitute into the differential equation and then simplify. And if you've done a few Cauchy-Euler equations, you know how it's going to simplify, and maybe you can skip to that next step. I'm going to go ahead and write it out here. Uh, so I'll have x cubed times the third derivative. plus x squared times the second derivative minus 4x times the first derivative. And I don't have a y term on this one, although if I did, I would substitute in the y for the y term. And then that has to be equal to 0. All right, so then I have some simplification, and this always happens the same way. So if you've done a few Cauchy-Euler equations, maybe you recognize what's going to happen. And this is why those series solutions terminate, is because of what happens in this step of the simplification. Uh, so x to the third times x to the r minus 3 just becomes x to the r. Just add the exponents, use basic algebra exponent rule. So I have r times r minus 1 times r minus 2 x to the r. And then same thing here, this will just become x to the r. And then this will just become also x to the r, so minus 4r x to the r. And that is supposed to be equal to 0. And I'm interested in this working for all values of x for which the solutions are defined. Um, so if this is true for all values of x, then it must be, I could factor out an x to the r. You don't want to divide through by that because that could be um, 0, depending on the value of x and your interval on which this solution might exist. But factor out an x to the r, I'm left with r times r minus 1 times r minus 2 plus r times r minus 1 minus 4r. And so if this is true for all values of x, this, which represents the coefficient of the x to the r term in this differential equation, this part would have to be equal to 0. So this is true when r times r minus 1 times r minus 2 plus r times r minus 1 minus 4r is equal to 0. So sometimes students think that you're actually dividing through by x to the r when you go from here to here, but that's not the logic of what's happened. It looks like that might be what's happening, but you're really taking this coefficient and setting it equal to 0. All right, and so then you're just going to solve for r. And so maybe the algebra is easy and maybe it's hard. Uh, this one's not too bad. Uh, I'm going to FOIL this out, r minus 1 times r minus 2, and also distribute through the r at the same time. So if you want to write out an intermediate step, you can do that as well. But here I'd have an r squared times r, and then I'd have a minus 3r times r, so minus 3r squared, and a plus 2 times r, and distribute through here. Um, be careful that you don't make a mistake in simplifying this. Uh, I have some like terms here, r squared terms, so minus 2r squared. Uh, and then some r terms, so 2r minus r is 1r, minus 4r is minus 3r. And then so you have a third order, poly third degree polynomial, and so you want to solve for r. In this case, I have a common factor of r that I could factor out, and then what's left is pretty easy to deal with. Sometimes this might be more complicated. You might have to use synthetic division or whatever kind of algebra is appropriate. Um, but here I can just factor out an r. I'm left with r squared minus 2r minus 3. And we'll just go up over here. So r times r minus 3 times r plus 1 is equal to 0. Set each factor equal to 0. I get r equals 0, r equals 3, and r equals negative 1. All right, so those are my r values. Remember that our guess was y equals x to the r, so our potential solutions would be y1 equals x to the 0, which is really just the constant function 1. y2 is x to the third, and y3 is x to the negative 1, or 1 over x, if you prefer to write it like that. Okay, so what I was after were three linearly independent solutions. Provided I get distinct real values for my r's, I get three solutions. And you could show that these are linearly independent, maybe just thinking through what those steps might be to show linear independence. You can see why they are linearly independent. 
I can't take a sum of scalar multiples of say one and one over x and get x cubed function, just thinking about them in terms of the graph. Um, or you can use the definition or the Ronskian to show linear independence. But these are linearly independent. If you have repeated R values, we talked about how to do that with a second order Cauchy-Euler equation. If you have non-real R values, we also talked about that. That involves some logarithms and some trig functions. Um, so in this case, though, I got very simple solutions here. So these are three linearly independent functions, which form a basis for the solution space. Um, so there are a couple ways that it might ask you to give your answer. You might be asked to give a basis for the solution space. So this set of functions, one x cubed and one over x would be a basis for the solution set, solution space. Um, that's also sometimes called a fundamental set of solutions. A basis for the solution space is a fundamental set of solutions. In this case though, the instructions just said solve. So really what it's asking us to write down is a general solution, which is the set of all solutions to this differential equation. So that would just be the span of this set or y equals c1 times one of them. I'll just use one for what, it doesn't matter what order you put them in here. I use one, so c1 times one is just c1 plus c2 times another one plus c3 times a third one where C1, C2, and C3 can take on all real values. All right, clearly this solution is not defined at x equals zero, so depending on where I have initial conditions, I would have an interval of existence for this solution that would either be negative infinity to zero or zero to infinity, not both. Obviously we can't include zero and we can't skip from one region to another without passing through zero. So we don't have initial conditions, so we don't know which interval we would be looking at here, but if you were given initial conditions, you'd pay attention to where those are for x values, and that would tell you your interval of existence. All right, try some homework problems like this.